following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing, and the asses feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another, and said, The fire of God has fallen from heaven, and hath burned up the sheep and the servants, and consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another, and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands, and fell upon the camels, and have carried them away. Yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And while he was yet speaking, there came also another, and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house, and behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness, and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, the Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this Job sinned not nor charged God foolishly. The story of Job is a story of initiation. Job in the Bible is a character who teaches us about this paramita or perfection of patience. But this paramita or conscious attitude is not Patience in the sense of being passive, or patience in the sense of letting people do whatever they want to you. Patience is a very active force and takes great strength. Another word which can be used is forbearance or endurance. And these Alternate terms more accurately describe the basis, the function, the feeling of the paramita of patience. In our analysis of the paramitas thus far, we have already looked at two in some detail. The first one we were calling generosity. And the second one, we were calling discipline or ethics.
And these are, of course, conscious attitudes. Or, in other words, qualities of mind. They aren't aphorisms or golden rules that we repeat to ourselves or remind ourselves of. These are states of being that are inherent in the nature of mind, but that have been, become obscured by our own ego, by the nature of our own subjective psyche. So to fully experience, to fully develop, to fully activate these attitudes or conscious qualities, we have to remove the obscurations, the filters, the bottles that imprison the mind, the consciousness. When we talk about the paramitas in terms of bodhisattva levels or bhumis, these three, generosity, discipline, and patience, would then be called, generosity would be called perfect joy. And discipline would be called immaculate. And patience, luminous. Luminous means light. Enlightened, something that gives light, something that provides light or radiates. And as you recall, the first paramita, generosity, is the intention of the bodhisattva. It is the, the, the very nature of bodhicitta, which is the awakening mind of compassion and comprehension of emptiness. The generosity of the bodhisattva is that loving kindness, the compassion combined with wisdom which sets up an intention. It is a, a way forward. It is a sense of direction, a purpose, a goal, a reason to be. The bodhisattva, as the, as the term defines it, is the incarnation or the essence of wisdom, the vehicle for the light of Christ. So a bodhisattva is the one who expresses the will of God in all their actions. And that expression must come through a clean and clear mind, something that doesn't have obscuration, in order for that expression to be perfect. The motivating drive of the light is love. Is generosity, love for all beings, without distinction, without restriction. There is an old, very old, ancient prayer. May all beings be happy. May all beings be joyful. May all beings be in peace. This doesn't say, may all beings be happy, Except my boss, my enemies, my neighbors. It is all beings, without exception. This is the intention, the will, which drives the light of Christ, the wisdom, which illuminates all the Buddhas, all the angels, all the gods. That light expressed becomes the path, becomes bodhicitta. So as an aspirant, 
as someone who intends to incarnate that, we have these steps, the practices, the processes that we have to go through. The first is this generosity to start to cultivate the attitude of bodhicitta. And remember, that attitude is compassion for all beings, without exception, and comprehension of emptiness. It's both. To comprehend the inherent emptiness of all phenomena is critical. And for us, to accomplish that, we need the remaining paramitas. When that intention is built, when we start defining ourselves and saying, I want to cultivate that quality of love. So we start with that inspiration, that intention. And this is the first paramita, or in other words, the first factor. But that factor is in need of being managed because we have obscurations. We have problems in our mind. We suffer. We suffer from pride, from fear, from envy, from jealousy, gluttony, uncertainty, doubt. Because of that, we have to learn discipline which, of course, we talked about in a previous lecture. This is the second factor. This is, in other words, how we learn to discipline our mind. When we look at these two forces, we need to consider it in light of the three forces that we study in Gnosis. And these three are, of course, symbolized in the form of a triangle, which we have three triangles in the Tree of Life. And each of these is an expression of the Law of Three. It's the balancing of the Law of Three that creates when three factors are brought into equilibrium. The first force is the intention the idea, the will. This is the first arcanum of the tarot, which is called the magician. And the magician is the magi, the priest, the being, the consciousness, that expression of Christ, love. So in the case of the paramitas, the first arcanum, the first factor, the first force, would be the generosity, love, the intention to become a bodhisattva. But there are factors which oppose it. Factors in us. We may have the intention, but within our own mind is a lot of resistance to that, opposing forces to that intention. And those opposing forces you know of as Anger, pride, shame, fear, and all of the multiple diverse entities that exist within our own mind. All of these factors oppose that intention, the pure intention to become a bodhisattva. We can also have egotistical intentions to become a bodhisattva because our pride wants to be admired, wants to be special, wants to be different. That's not what I'm discussing. That egotistical desire to be a bodhisattva is actually an opposing factor to the real, sincere, heartfelt intention to cultivate bodhicitta. So put this in your imagination, these two opposing factors. The intention, the resistance. And the resistance is your own mind, your ego. This is why we apply the second paramita, discipline, Discipline is there to control the opposing factor, factors, which is our own psyche. But with these two alone, 
There's only conflict. And you'll notice this in yourself. When you develop an idea to do something, immediately there springs up, as if by magic, all the opposing forces. Let's say you need to get a job. And as soon as that intention is there, the idea is there, then all the difficulties arise. All of the things that you have to overcome in order to actually get the job you need. And there will be many difficulties, depending on the circumstances and the karma. In order for you to successfully complete your goal, the mere intention to do it is not enough. You need endurance. You need forbearance. You need patience. Again, remember, patience is not passive. It's active. So if you need a job and you want a job, but you see all the opposing difficulties, let's say the the career you're looking at is very competitive. There's not a, a, a wide variety of jobs available. There aren't many. You have to go against all of that. Plus... You'll have your own pride, who may think you deserve a better job than the one that's available. You may have your own laziness, who doesn't really want to prepare a new resume, who doesn't really want to go through the interview process, who doesn't really want to deal with the commute. It's all these forces of resistance. If you simply had the intention and you saw those forces of resistance, you would stop. You wouldn't even try. So to accomplish it, you need endurance to accept those difficulties and to work through them, to overcome them. That is the third force. Patience. Forbearance. Endurance. In other words, patience is the capacity to overcome and transform difficulty. Patience does not mean that you simply receive suffering and suffer. It means you transform suffering to your advantage. And there's a major, major distinction between those two. The difference is will. What we're really discussing when we discuss endurance, forbearance, or patience is willpower. Each of these three forces involves willpower. We have the intention to get that job. Then we have the discipline to control our own mind as our mind fights with us to stop trying to get the job, to give up, or to complain. And then we have the will to be patient and to finally succeed. We have this idea, somehow, when we see great works, such as the symphonies of Beethoven, or a great painting, like Botticelli, that that was easy for that person to do. And we wish we had that capacity. Nothing worthwhile is easy. Nothing. The great masters who produced fantastic, immortal works of art didn't arrive at the moment of creating that just by happenstance, just by a gift of God. They worked. They practiced. They had discipline. They had endurance. Yogananda gives a really good example of this. He said that we all admire the skill of a concert pianist. And it's true. If you really watch someone who's a very skilled pianist who plays piano for concerts for classical music and plays it very well, they make it look so easy. And we wish we could do that. But we want to just be able to sit down at the piano and do it without having worked for it. And we forget that that person 
to get there has been practicing for eight to ten hours every day for years. They didn't just get that out of nowhere. Everything is based on causes and conditions. Everything has root causes, things that produce that result. So someone who has the skill to play an instrument in that way has had to practice, has had to study. They have the desire, the intention, the motivation to learn it, and they have all their own resistance. They all have their own laziness. They have the difficulties of life, difficulties to survive financially doing a type of career like that. But that patience, the endurance, the forbearance comes into play. So how much more true is this, Yogananda says, of meditation? We would all love, as students of this teaching, to be masters of samadhi, as the Master Samael states. But we want it to be easy, as if we can read a couple of pages of a book and go meditate, and boom, we have mastery of samadhi. But it isn't like that. To acquire mastery of samadhi requires mastery of your own mind. And this is not arrived at by snapping your fingers or reading a book. It's through endurance, forbearance. So, patience or endurance in uh, Buddhism is looked at as having three primary forms or three ways that it's analyzed in order to be understood. And the first one is to have endurance when being harmed. This refers to having the ability to maintain control over the mind, control of attention, to maintain mindfulness, conscious awareness. And those moments when somebody is harming us. For example, if someone's criticizing us. To maintain the generosity, the first perfection, to maintain the discipline of the mind, and to access those two, to manage those two with willpower, with endurance. So you see how these three interrelate. The quality of patience or endurance is there and is necessary at this stage because we've already established some degree of Generosity, the motivation, and two, the discipline. The endurance is there to help us manage those, to sustain them, to protect bodhicitta. Once we have the intention to become the vessel for Christ, to become the vehicle of wisdom in order to serve suffering humanity, We need to cultivate that. And we need to protect it. The discipline, of course, is partly how we protect it. We have to protect our bodhicitta, our own kindness, our own patience, our own love, with our discipline. But we also need to be patient with that. So, patience in this sense, or endurance, does not mean that we seek to eradicate harmful or difficult circumstances. We have the intention to eliminate suffering, yes. But there's no way that we can possibly eliminate all of the harmful beings that exist. And in fact, that's not our goal. Our goal is not to eliminate harmful beings. 
to eliminate suffering. This is different. Some teachings present the point of view that we have to eliminate the enemies, the infidels, the unbelievers. And this is a wrong way of thinking. To think that we have to eliminate other people or other beings. This is not true. We have to instead look at life in the terms of bodhicitta. All beings are like you and me. All beings want happiness. And we're all naturally attracted to states of happiness and states of joyfulness. The Dalai Lama points out that if we hear of a heavenly realm or a heavenly place where there's no war, there's no poverty, there's no starvation, no rape, no abuse, but instead there is serenity, peace, joyfulness, acceptance, cooperation, friendship, love. All of us want to be there, without exception. And if we hear of a place where there's warfare, pain, violence, destruction, abuse, rape, death, we don't want to be there. And this illustrates a fundamental aspect of the nature of our own psyche, which is that we all want love and peace. Therefore, what we have to understand is that we all share that. And the goal of bodhicitta is to provide that. It's not to eliminate beings. It's to provide them with happiness. So when we're being harmed by others, this is an important thing to use in order to train the mind. To remember that the person who's harming is a being like us. But that being, that person who's harmful, is identified. Identified with their anger, with their resentment, with their hatred, with their pride. Our job in that case is to transform our mind, to transform our reaction. When we analyze someone who's angry, we see that that person is suffering. Anger is not pleasant in any way. And when you experience anger, you can taste that for yourself. The purpose, the intention of anger is to harm. And that way, anger can be seen as the opposite of bodhicitta. The opposite of love. Anger is really hate. And it's a quality or a negative emotion which seeks to make people suffer, to make beings suffer. Not only that, but when we experience anger, it makes us suffer too. So what is the good of anger? What good can anger ever provide? Unfortunately, in these times, there are some who argue to, pr- to protect anger to encourage anger. And this is clear when you look at TV or movies where anger is glorified. Anger is shown to be something admirable. But it is not. Anger is a form of suffering. And it's a very painful form of suffering. And yet we persist in feeding our anger. And this is because we ignore its roots. We fail to grasp what anger really is and thus we perpetuate suffering. Of course, the basis of this teaching is to learn how to observe ourselves and change. If we learn to really look at anger, 
to observe anger. We'll find that it's a very agitated form of energy. When we get angry, we can't sleep. We might lose our appetite. We become obsessed. The mind becomes so fixated on what it perceives as the source of anger that the mind becomes a beast, an animal, out of control. And someone who's really identified with their anger fully becomes that beast and is capable of extreme violence. And we can see this in cases of people who otherwise would be quite pleasant, quite attractive, even sweet. But when the anger comes into their mind and they don't have the capacity to control it, that sweet person has the capacity to kill. And that sweet person is you and me. Each of us has that sweetness inside. We also have that anger, the capacity for violence. And maybe we haven't tasted it yet. Maybe we haven't been in the circumstances that bring that out. But what if we are? What if those circumstances come? And they might. It's important for us to learn to guard the mind, to discipline ourselves. When we really look at anger, someone who becomes angry really begins to behave like a lunatic. Someone who becomes enraged even has the capacity to harm those that they love. This is really the great tragedy that our society in these times fails to realize the extreme danger of anger. This is why when the various masters of different teachings look at the root causes of suffering, anger is always one of them. Anger. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna identifies three doors to hell and anger is one of them. In the writings of Samael and Vyor, he identifies three doors to suffering, and anger is one of them. We cannot be loose, lax with anger. In, in the Tibetan tradition, they have a saying that says, don't even allow in a needle because it will demand more room. So you know how small a needle is, right, for sewing? We have to have our attention so focused and refined that we don't even allow something like a sliver of negativity into our mind because that sliver can corrupt the entire thing. It will weed, it will wiggle its way around and destroy. And really that's all anger wants, is destruction. Anger wants to harm. Nothing else. So when we look at anger, we need to look at what it's coming from in ourselves. When we experience something difficult, painful, frustrating, and we become angry. Analyze that. Why do you become angry? I've heard some teachings, some teachers, rather, who state that anger arises because of pride or fear. And from my own experience, I would disagree. I would say this is not the whole picture. From my experience, I would say anger arises because of desire. Frustrated desire. But that frustrated desire can come from any number of aggregates in the mind. Not just pride or fear. You can find this out for yourself if you travel, 
travel is very frustrating. Especially if you travel in a country or a part of the world that has fewer amenities. Say, for example, you go and travel, and the nature of your experience in that trip prevents you from having access to food, which will easily happen depending on where in the world you travel. You may not be able to find something good or safe to eat for a day or more. Don't you think you'll become angry? How easily do we become angry because of a meal? If we are a little late to get our lunch or our dinner, some of us become enraged. And who are we angry with? And this is the most interesting thing of all. Who do we become angry with? Everybody else. The whole world becomes to blame because we're hungry. And this is a good experience for us to have if we transform it because it demonstrates the weakness of the mind. The mind we have is very weak. We need will to dominate that mind and train it. What if, for example, you're preparing a meal and you cut yourself with a knife? Who do you become angry with? Yourself or the knife? Or what if you shut your finger in the door of the car? Who do you become angry with? I've seen people do that and get angry at the car and kick the car. It's not the car's fault. It's the stupid person who wasn't paying attention. But they don't get mad at themselves. They get angry at the car. Either way, the anger serves no purpose. It doesn't solve anything. What does it fix? If you've shut your finger in the car door and it hurts, what is anger going to solve? The harm is done. So why become angry? If someone criticizes you, attacks you, says something very hurtful, then in this case, it's easy to become angry with them. It's a very habitual reaction to reply to a harmful remark with anger. But it doesn't help. And it demonstrates a lack of comprehension, a lack of understanding. It's important for us to closely analyze our experiences of anger. Let's look just for an example at a given experience and we'll make it kind of crude. And this example is actually given in the book by Shanti Deva, the Bodhicharya Vatara, which is, of course, the Bodhisattva's way of life, which we're discussing. In this book, he he outlines and analyzes the case of when someone strikes us with a weapon. Usually when we are hit or harmed, we become angry. And our anger is directed at the person who delivered the blow. But we need to analyze What actually causes the harm is the interaction between the weapon and the body. The suffering that we feel is actually in the body. So why do we not become angry with the body? The pain is there. 
the body is the one producing the pain. So why are we not angry with the body? Another step. The weapon is the one who struck us and caused the pain. So why are we not angry with the weapon? Instead, we get angry with the person. But did the person really bear full responsibility for that? If we were not there, then we would not have been harmed. So why are we not angry with ourselves? We put ourselves there. We're partly to blame. Not only that, but there's also the surrounding circumstances. The whole picture. All of the given factors that brought about the conjunction of these various elements. Why are we not angry with all of that? So, this example is given so that we can analyze the short-sightedness of anger, the ignorance of anger, the foolishness of anger. Anger is not logical. It is a form of passion. It is not smart. <clears throat> and we have this problem of becoming victimized by our own anger. And the anger arises, and it has its own thoughts, it has its own feelings, and it has its own, its own intentions. So we need to look closely at those. When anger comes up, what does it intend? We need to have self-awareness, mindfulness, and analyze that intention. The anger that we feel, what does it want? And be sincere. When you feel anger, is anger really justified? Does anger exist in harmony with our real intention, which is bodhicitta? And the scriptures say no. And the teachings say no. There is not one case where anger is justified. Ever. Now your mind is probably thinking, well, what about Jesus getting angry with the merchants in the temple? What about those fierce gods that we see? The ferocious deities and the different traditions who appear angry. But let's not confuse ferocity with anger. Anger is an ego, is a defect. It is a form of suffering. Ferocity or fierce nature is not. <clears throat> anger is a state of suffering and if we can analyze it as such we can begin to free ourselves from its influence when we experience a state of anger a very good thing to keep in mind is that the anger is temporary and so let's just be patient don't act when the stimulant of anger is there, stirring up your mind, making you agitated, the best thing you can do is slow down. This is why the psychologists these days always tell you, count to ten. When you get angry, count to ten. It's good advice. It's very good advice. Slow down. Control your mind. Don't act. Wait. The anger, you'll notice, stimulates you to harm others. And that's all it will ever do. To harm. So if you're serious about your intention to develop bodhicitta, to develop compassionate mind, you have to be very strict with the enemy of anger. And not allow it even a needle of space to move. Be very strict. When we're dealing with someone who's angry, this is also very challenging. Our tendency is to get angry in return. Right? If someone comes to us enraged and angry and blasting us with their words and with their emotions, 
our normal reaction is to also get angry. We may not get angry outward and express it. We may internalize that anger back into ourselves. That becomes depression. Depression is anger internalized. That's all it is. People who are depressed are angry, but they don't deal with their anger. So the best thing to do when someone's coming at us with anger is to slow down and look at that person and remember how they suffer. Look at the suffering that they are undergoing, how much their anger is causing them pain. So we should have compassion for them. We should have love for them because they suffer. They're in pain. If our, if our child was in pain, was suffering, we wouldn't get angry with them. If as a doctor, we have a patient who comes to us who's in great pain, we would never get angry with them. We want to help them. We want to help relieve that pain. Anger is just an illness. Anger is a sickness. It is a disease in the mind, in the heart. So when we encounter anger, we should remember that. That the person who's suffering with anger is sick. And getting angry at them is only going to make it worse for both of us. When you've experienced anger, it has a quality of fire, right? It's a very fiery, passionate feeling. What happens when you add fire to fire? More pain. So getting angry in return serves no purpose. The best thing you can do is reply with sweetness. Not sanctimony. Don't fake sweetness, because this will make them more angry. Be sincere. Sweetness is the greatest power to overcome anger. Nothing has more power than sweetness. And if you work with it, you'll find that for yourself. Dealing with your own anger first. When your own anger arises, be disciplined, but be sweet with yourself. Be patient with yourself. When someone you love is angry, be sweet with them. Be patient with them. Be tolerant. And you'll discover that that natural sweetness, that natural love, can completely transform not only your own mind, but the mind of another person. When they discover that their anger is not affecting you, that anger can dissipate. And then you can really solve whatever the problem is. But as long as the anger is active, the problem can never be solved because the anger will not be satisfied until it hurts someone. They say to never go to bed angry. This is a true thing. And this is because when you go to sleep, your state of mind at that time, sets up the quality through which you will enter into the world of dreams. And if you're angry, agitated, and upset when you go to sleep, you will carry that emotional baggage, and that's what you will experience all night, is the klipoth, the world where anger resides, the submerged levels of the mind. Hell. You'll have nightmares. The best thing to do if you're angry in the evening is meditate. Relax. Give yourself some good food, psychological food. Listen to some beautiful music. Read poetry. Do some artwork. Make art. 
Take a walk. Do something to clear your mind. So when we're dealing with angry people, we have to realize that that force of anger is very projective. When we learn to receive that impression, that energy, with sweetness, we can dissipate that force. And this is why in the books of the Master Samael and Vior, he says, we have to learn to receive with gladness the unpleasant manifestations of our fellow men. Whatever people do to us, we have to accept that with patience and tolerance and not respond with anger. And we can look to the lives of the various masters to inspire us in that way. Jesus was tortured, whipped, beaten, spit upon, ridiculed, and he didn't get angry. And this wasn't faked. This was because he had trained himself to such a degree that there was no anger in him. Therefore, when the weapons struck, there was no I to reply with anger. There's no ego that can react. There's only bodhicitta, which is that compassionate mind. The Master Samael states as well that if someone criticizes us, we can consider this like a check, a bank check. And if you write a bank check but there's no money in the bank, the check is worthless. The same is true of criticism. If there's no I, the criticism is worthless. People can say what they want, but there's no I, there's no me, there's no ego, no pride to react. But this is something we have to work towards. We aren't at that level. It's good to remember this in the moments when we are criticized, when we are attacked, when we do face difficulties. We remember it because we need to discipline our mind. You probably heard another saying that says, only the guilty feel the accusation. So when somebody criticizes us and it hurts, you should be happy. Because in that instant, you've discovered an ego in your mind. And this is the greatest joy for the Gnostic. The ego is that which causes suffering. If you can't find it, you can't eliminate it. And thus, suffering continues. But when someone criticizes you, and that pain is there, then you have something you can work with. So in reality, you should, you should be grateful to that person who criticized you. They've done you a favor. They've shown you what you need to change. This is the greatest thing. In Buddhism, they talk about two fields within which the initiate works. So it's like the way a farmer works in a field, right? In the first field are all the Buddhas. And in the second field are all the beings. The Buddhas cannot help us to develop patience. The Buddhas cannot help us to develop endurance. Tolerance. The Buddhas can teach us the path, and we need that. And they can provide assistance, and we need that. But the only ones who can teach us how to be patient, how to be tolerant, how to have compassion, are those beings which are hostile towards us. So in reality, we need both in order to achieve liberation. 
If there were only Buddhas, they would only treat us with love, with sweetness, with compassion. And thus we would never see our defects. And thus we would always remain in our level. In ignorance, in suffering. But fortunately, we have a lot of hostile beings (laughs) around us. It's fortunate in the sense that we can take advantage of circumstances. And this is the basis of Tantra, to transform energy, to take energy and make it something good, make it something useful, transform it by will. So when people are angry with us, when they are criticizing us, attacking us, pursuing us, It doesn't mean that what they're doing is right. It doesn't mean that we should allow them to do wrong things to us. What it means is that we should cultivate the quality of mind that does not become angry. That instead receives that impression, that circumstance, with happiness. Because in that circumstance is an opportunity for us to change. And we need that. And this way, you could say that these times in which we live are profoundly ripe for transformation for us. Because these are very difficult times. There are a lot of hostile beings in the world. There's a lot of difficulty. There's a lot of suffering. There is a lot of ignorance. When we encounter ignorance and we encounter harmful people, we should learn to transform our mind and treat them with compassion, with kindness. In truth, we should treat the beings and the Buddhas in the same way, with respect. This is the nature of tolerance. Conscious tolerance treats all beings the same. Even demons. In these teachings, we talk about demons sometimes. We talk about black magicians, sorcerers. And by these terms, we mean people who intend to harm. And there are a lot of people like that. They may have good intentions in their mind, but by results, they harm people. There are some who think they're doing good, but who are actually harming The Buddhas treat them all in the same way. An angel treats all beings in the same way. With respect, with love and tolerance. But, that does not mean we condone the crimes. It doesn't mean that we agree with what harmful actions are being done. And it does not mean we allow it to continue. When we observe harmful action, if we can do something to stop it, we should. In Tibet, when the Chinese invaded and they were raping nuns, some monks stood by and allowed it to happen because they thought it would be wrong to harm the Chinese. This is a mistake. These monks thought that nonviolence was an absolute law. This is a mistake. And the Dalai Lama said that. We have to weigh circumstances. Those monks should have fought to protect the innocent. 
to stop the harmful beings from performing wrong action. This is a compassionate act, not only for the person who is going to be hurt, but for the person who is going to uh, apply the pain. If you have two children and one child wants to hit the other one, you should stop the child from hitting. We should not stand by and, quote, be patient. This is not a solution. Patience does not mean passivity. We have to be active. So in our effort to deal with other beings, to be tolerant, to be patient, the basic practice, the basic thing that we need to learn is how to transform those circumstances for the good of everyone. Not only for our own good, but for the good of the harmful being as well. In the Gnostic tradition, we have some different types of prayers and practices that we can use to protect ourselves from beings who would try to harm us. And unfortunately, there are some students who somehow get the idea that we should be very um, wrathful with other beings, with harmful beings. So, for example, if they believe that a given person is a black magician or a witch or a sorcerer, then these students think that they should be very ferocious, fierce, angry with these so-called black magicians. This is wrong. You cannot combat violence with violence. You cannot dispel darkness with hatred. Only with light, with truth, with sweetness, with love. Let us remember that great persecutor of the Gnostics, a man who was killing Gnostics, If he had been treated in kind, eye for an eye, we would not have a great portion of the Bible, which is so important to us now. Paul. Who became a great Gnostic. Because he was given light in exchange for his violence. And it taught him. And he was changed. So whenever someone's doing harm to us, we should remember, this is a chance for me to learn patience. This is a chance for me to practice. We should be grateful. Uh, This brings up the point that there is also a quality of mind that's very prevalent in these times which is the tendency to see other beings as enemies. And this is cultivated to a large degree by the types of psychological food that we take in, like the news and movies. We tend to see other beings as our enemies. We have this feeling that people are out to get us, that we can't trust people. And we have a a fear or a resentment against society, against our own family, and even against friends. We may have friendships to a certain level, but at certain moments perceive our friends as enemies. It's good for us to analyze that state of mind. And regarding this, the Dalai Lama said something very useful. He said that If the love within your mind is lost and you see other beings as enemies, then no matter how much education 
or knowledge or material comfort you have, only suffering and confusion will ensue. It's good for us to learn to transform our mind, to see other beings as being like us. We all want happiness. We all want to be accepted. We all want to be treated with patience, with kindness, with respect. We should do that too. Gandhi said we should be the change we want to see. If we want other beings to be patient, to be kind, to be tolerant of us, we should be so. We should treat others in that way. This is actually the surest way to overcome those that we actually do have as enemies. When you can really look at an enemy, someone who's actually doing something to hurt you, and comprehend that it isn't the person who is your enemy. It is their ego. Which you have too. It is their anger that is your enemy. But it's also their enemy. Think about that. A person who is doing harm to you is hurting themselves also. Because they're listening to their own enemy inside. So we should have compassion on them. We should be patient with them. When we can really be sincere with that feeling, to look at someone who we would normally see as an enemy and realize that that person is suffering and that they're being a victim of their own inner enemy, we can really have compassion for them. Not only that, they could become our friend. Easily. When you look at life on a longer scale, when you realize that this physical body that you're in now is not the only one you've had. There have been others. And throughout each existence, you've interacted with a certain group of people in a cyclical kind of way. You realize that people that are now your friends may one day be your enemies. And people that are now your enemies may one day be your friends. You may find that the people that are now your enemies may have been your parents before, may have been your children. This kind of perspective is very healthy. It helps to bring you out of the narrow-minded focus of the ego, which is looking at very restricted point of view of circumstances, like our example with the weapon. When we're angry against the person who's hitting us, we're failing to realize we put ourselves there. Those circumstances are what brought that, all those elements together. The same is true with people we perceive as enemies or friends. So it's really senseless to become angry. The second... form of endurance or patience is regarding facing facing suffering in general or hardships in general. The third one is having patience with the nature of reality. To be patient or tolerant with hardships is really related to understanding our own goals. When we set out to study this type of information, to study this knowledge, it's because we have the intention, to some degree, to awaken the consciousness, to develop ourselves as a human being. 
to experience those things which are beyond the flesh, the realities that are beyond the five senses. But those experiences do not come without a price. We have to work. We have to earn those things. We have to develop capacities in ourselves, which right now we don't have. This takes effort. That effort is the tolerance, the endurance, to overcome the hardships that we have to face. To become a master of samadhi, we have to meditate. Meditation is not easy. It's not easy because of our mind. In its essence, meditation is extremely simple. Because the nature of mind is luminous and clear without complication. Therefore, it's easy. But to arrive at that experience is difficult because our mind is so filled with obstacles. So it takes endurance to move past those obstacles, to overcome the difficulties. The hardships that we face are the payments that we make in order to earn that which we need, that which we want. Kabbalah is not easy. The studies of Kabbalah are very difficult. They are a knowledge of the consciousness, which is beyond the capacities of our sensual mind, of our intellect. We have to work with the inner mind, the abstract mind, which at this point we barely know even exists. And so to really understand the tree of life, to understand the tree of knowledge, requires a lot of work. It's not easy. This is why Jesus said that the door, the path to the door is narrow and difficult. The way to destruction is wide and easy. Unfortunately, there are some, even within the Gnostic movement, who say that Kabbalah is not necessary, that learning all these different practices is not necessary. And this is very sad because it demonstrates a complete lack of understanding of the teaching. The Kabbalah expresses the language of the soul, the language of the consciousness, which is a symbolic language, which is an abstract language. It's a very beautiful language and very subtle and has an enormous amount of depth. It seems that in those cases where Students reject the study of Kabbalah, it's because they're lazy. Because they don't understand and they don't want to understand. And so they believe that they can go by without it. This is like trying to go to some place you've never been and not having a map. It's foolish. If you want to go someplace you haven't been, you need a map. The map is here, the tree of life, the Kabbalah. The map is in the consciousness. And we discover that through study and through work. And this requires that we have the diligence, the the endurance to overcome the difficulties. Similar to when we were children, you know, school at certain times can become very difficult. And we don't understand why we have to go. And we don't want to go. We'd rather stay home and play. But let us not be students like that now. The studies of Kabbalah are essential to successfully navigate the interior worlds. If you go into another country and you don't speak the language, you can be easily manipulated. Right? If you go to Asia, if you go to China and you don't speak Chinese, what's going to happen to you? Can you eat? Can you get a place to sleep? Only if you're lucky will you find somebody who will help you and be sincere about it. But if the vultures who are there discover that you don't speak the language, they'll take you for everything you've got. 
I'm not saying that about China specifically. I'm saying when you go to another country, some other place, you're exposed to a certain amount of risk. The more you know, the more safely you can navigate that terrain. This is especially true of the mind. The Kabbalah is a map of your own mind, your own consciousness. When you have experiences in meditation, when you have experiences out of the body, this map is your guide. So it's not enough to just put it in the intellect. You have to know it in your consciousness. So it's important. But it isn't easy to learn. There are many other hardships that we encounter to awaken the consciousness. Many difficulties. The fundamental purpose of Gnosis is to awaken the consciousness to overcome suffering. Suffering exists because we have an ego. We have an I. We have pride, lust, greed, envy, gluttony, fear. Therefore, to conquer suffering is to conquer our own mind, our own self, false self. But we cannot conquer that unless we see it. And to see it is painful. We have the tendency, when we see something painful in ourselves or contradictory in ourselves, we run away. We don't want to see it. When somebody says something about us, you're too impatient, you're too angry, you're too proud, we don't want to hear that. We don't want to be criticized. We only want to be praised. But do you know that praise is poison for your work? And do you know that criticism is the best thing you could get? Praise is toxic for spiritual work because it builds pride in you. It also builds jealousy in others. People see you getting praise. They become very envious and jealous, so they turn against you. You build pride, so you become inflated and fat. What good does praise do? When someone criticizes, on the other hand, it's good. Breaks down pride. Shows you your own faults and gives you a place to work. And this is good. It takes an enormous amount of endurance, patience, to overcome the difficulties that we inevitably must face if we want to face ourselves. To truly face our own inner contradictions. Our own filth. If you've ever trained a dog, you know when you're trying to train them to go to the bathroom on the paper, it's not an easy thing. It takes patience. It takes tolerance. But if the dog makes a mistake and goes to the bathroom somewhere else on the floor and you want to show them that mistake, they don't want to see it. Right? They resist. They fight. They don't want to go there. They don't want to see it. They don't want you to put their nose in it. They whimper. They cry. We're like that. When someone wants to show us our own filth, our own mistake, we don't want to see it. We want to justify Oh, I didn't know. Oh, I meant to do something else. Oh, that wasn't me. If you persist in that attitude, your work will be slow. Transform your mind. Look actively for your faults. Look joyfully for your faults and transform your mind. There are also sufferings related to practice. Meditation is difficult. It's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable physically in the beginning. 
because we're not accustomed to sitting still and concentrating the mind. And then when we get past that obstacle, it becomes uncomfortable because we start seeing our own filthiness. And this also becomes very uncomfortable. It's the kind of suffering. And it takes endurance to sit and analyze your own mistakes without justifying them, without excusing them, and also without condemning them, but to see them as they are and learn how to change. We complain about meditation because it's hard to learn. We want an easier practice. We keep searching for different practices. We want someone to explain this and that. Meditation is not easy because of the mind. And the sooner we become serious about disciplining the mind, not just in the meditation practice, but all day long, then meditation becomes easier. But you have to have the discipline to sit. You have to have the patience to keep trying. It says in the Bible that, um, let me find it. Oh, I don't have it. We have to accept the difficulties. We have to expect them. To win a race requires effort. It's good for us when we're doing our meditation practice to really put it in perspective. What we're doing when we meditate is creating merit and creating benefit for ourselves and for others. And really, how much suffering is it to meditate for 10 minutes. We complain and we resist it, but how much suffering is that really? When you sit to meditate, or let's say, for example, you don't even want to because you're resisting the suffering of meditation. Remember this. The athletes of meditation... Meditate 24 hours a day without stopping. Lamas in Tibet, for example, go on a three-year retreat. Now, that retreat is not like we think of retreats in the West. For us, a retreat is you go out in the woods and you barbecue, you listen to the birds and swim, relax. This is not this kind of retreat. A three-year retreat, traditionally in Tibetan Buddhism, you go into an isolated place, usually a cave, and you stay there for three years. You never come out. Not only that, all you do is meditate. There's no TV, no video games, no books, no magazines, no stores, no shopping, No telephones. There's your little box. It's called a meditation box. And you're thinking, box? What is a meditation box? Meditation box sits around your legs as you sit cross-legged on the ground. So you can't lie down. The Lama who's on the three-year retreat does not sleep. They don't sleep, not even at night. They meditate all night long, sitting upright. They meditate all day long, sitting upright. Now, they do other things. They do some, what are called... um, Yantras, which are yogic practices. They receive instruction from their teachers. They eat once. So just remember that when you're on your nice, comfortable bed, your nice, comfortable couch, in your safe home, 
with incense and candles, music, and you're complaining. Put your practice in perspective. You know, this brings up something also in my memory about the hardship of practice. In traditional uh, monastic practices, the monks don't cook for themselves. Um, In fact, in Asian traditions, they beg for food. Once a day, they go out and they go to the neighboring houses with a bowl, one little bowl, and they take whatever food they're given and that's their food for the day. They can't say, oh, can I have fries with that? Or can I have less salt? Uh, I don't eat pork. Um, I don't like eggplant. Whatever they're given, they eat gratefully, and that's it. I mention this because we're very spoiled. We're very lazy. We want everything just so. We have no capacity at all to endure hardship. We have to train ourselves while we have the opportunity. Things will not always be as they are now. What if you become sick? What if you become ill? Very sick. You'll lose your opportunity to practice. What if you die? What if all of a sudden we have a war here? How easy will it be to practice then? Think carefully on these things. I'm not saying these things to scare you. I'm saying them to motivate you to be serious. All things are impermanent. And the karma of humanity is very heavy. Difficulties are coming, not only in our individual lives, but in our collective environment. We need to train ourselves to handle it. In the book Revolutionary Psychology, the Master Samael on Vior points out that we all boast and strut around like peacocks as if we're very powerful. But we get just a little stomach ache and we become miserable lunatics. Complaining, whining, moaning. And he says, if you take one of us and put us out in the desert, alone, with nothing, you'll see exactly how weak we are. And this is true. We're so boastful and proud and conceited, but we're actually very weak. The suffering that we're receiving is something that we can take advantage of in order to train ourselves to become strong. This is the nature of the path of the Bodhisattva, to transform suffering into benefit, to become strong. Really, you can look at it like this. When a parent teaches a child how to walk, how to ride a bicycle, parent will give the instruction and then be there to hold the hand of the child or hold the bicycle upright as the child tries it. But at a certain point, the parent has to let go. And the child has to learn how to do it under their own power. And they fall, and they get hurt, and they cry. If that parent does not allow the child to do it on their own and to experience that suffering, the child will remain weak and ignorant. They won't learn to walk or they won't learn to ride the bicycle. The parent who has discipline, who knows what's best for that child, will stand by, even though it's painful, and allow the child 
to ride the bicycle and maybe fall and maybe get hurt and maybe cry, but knowing that the child needs that experience in order to grow. The Bodhisattva does the same thing with their own mind. We receive these teachings as guidance in order to give us the basic instructions of how we need to cultivate bodhicitta and discipline our mind. But then we need to experience life. We need to be in the circumstances and doing it, riding the bicycle. And sometimes we fall, and sometimes we get hurt, and it's painful. But let us get back on the bicycle and keep going. This is patience. The capacity to endure and keep going. It's very sad when we see students who, as soon as they encounter some circumstance that shows them their own weakness, that shows them their own pride, their own lust, their own fear, that they leave. That they run away from Gnosis. This is very sad. Because that soul is too weak to face themselves, to face their own reality. This is very sad. We should have a lot of compassion for those people because that pain is tremendous. And we should do what we can to inspire them to try again. To get back on the bicycle and keep trying. To learn to discipline the mind. Because anyone can learn it if they have the will to do it. Another example that I remember about hardships of practice. There was a monk in Tibet who was imprisoned by the Chinese for a long time. And he was tortured and abused. He eventually got out and he escaped to India and went into a long retreat and was there practicing in retreat. And one time, the, His Holiness the Dalai Lama came and spoke with the monk. And the monk said, you know, it's harder to practice here in retreat than it was in the Chinese prison. And it's true. If we have a very easy, comfortable environment, we have no inspiration to practice. Practice is difficult in that case. If we have no one being hostile towards us, we have no opportunity to learn patience, to learn tolerance, to learn sweetness. Therefore, when students complain about their difficulties, about how hard life is, about how cruel their spouse is to them, this is also sad because that student is missing an opportunity to take advantage of those circumstances, transform them for the benefit of everyone. What this indicates is that when we learn how to accept the hardships, that suffering becomes manageable. A good example of that is when we go to the doctor. The doctor is always poking us with needles, may have to do surgery, cutting us up with a knife. We accept that. That's a form of suffering, but we don't get mad at him. But if somebody else came and poked us with a needle and started trying to cut us with a knife, we'd get really angry. The only difference there is a fundamental shift of attitude. We can develop that same attitude towards all circumstances. To recognize that criticism, harmful beings, harmful things that are being done, actually can be transformed by us. There's no cause to be angry. So the third form of patience or tolerance is related to having patience or tolerance related to the nature of phenomena, the nature of reality. I saw a man who went out to his car and there was a lot of snow packed around the car. 
And this guy was cursing. And angry. He was so mad. It was like a stream of foul language flowing out of this guy. And I thought to myself, well, this is actually a beautiful thing to see before this lecture. <laughs> because he's demonstrating exactly how not to have tolerance with the nature of reality. Why is he angry at the snow? I'm sure if I asked him that, he'd realize the futility of all the energy he wasted. Because that's really all he was doing. He was wasting energy. Life is suffering. Yeah. Life is suffering. Whether we're on this path or not on this path, circumstances will be painful. Life is going to be painful because that is the nature of life. This is the first noble truth taught by the Buddha. We don't enter into the path to awaken the consciousness in order to eliminate negative circumstances or painful circumstances. That isn't the goal because it's impossible. You cannot. And unfortunately, many of us have this idea because we have that attraction to heaven, to nirvana, and we think, oh, let me just get out of this place. If I could die, I would die. But let this suffering end. But death is not an answer. And you know what? Neither is nirvana. Nirvana and samsara are both impermanent in the sense that the, the planes of nirvana, the worlds of nirvana, are states of consciousness that we can experience for a period of time. But as long as the ego is alive in us, it will be temporary. Our stay there will be temporary. So having the idea or the goal that we want to enter nirvana forever, don't be fooled. Don't be fooled by this desire. It's a desire that really just wants to be free of suffering. But suffering will persist as long as the ego is alive. The very desire for nirvana is a desire that produces suffering. Because it's a desire for something you don't have. And when you, have some, when you ha- don't have something that you want, you suffer. When we see that brand new computer that just came out, and we want it, that's suffering. When we see the big house down the street, and we want it, that's suffering. And when in our mind we think of nirvana, of liberation, and we want that, there's a kind of suffering there. Because it's a craving for something that we don't have. Let's be realistic. Suffering is there because of desire. If you remove the desire, the suffering is gone. This is why the path of the bodhisattva is not a nirvanic path. It is not a path to take you to nirvana. It is a path to take you beyond it. There are some in Gnosis who use the Gnostic teachings in order to teach the nirvanic path because that's what they practice. And that's fine. But that is not the bodhisattva path. That's the nirvanic. The nirvanic path takes you to having the capacity to exist in nirvana for a period of time. But that's it. The ego is still alive. That means part of your psyche still belongs to the klipoth, to hell. That means suffering will continue. This is the nature of reality. And there's a kind of suffering when we fail to recognize the nature of reality. 
You've probably heard of the serenity prayer. It's very famous now because of things like AA. The prayer goes something like, God, give us the grace to accept with serenity the things that cannot be changed and the courage to change the things that should be changed and the wisdom to distinguish one from the other. That prayer is a perfect explanation of the quality of discrimination that we need in order to develop this form of tolerance. There's a lot of snow on the ground and ice. Why should we get angry? We can't change it. We should discriminate between the things we can change and the things we cannot. In the Bodhicharya Avatara, Shantideva writes a very beautiful statement that we can use in every case of trying to develop patience. I want to read this to you so you get the, the full taste. If something can be remedied, why get into a foul mood over it? And if it can't be remedied, why get in a foul mood? Simple, right? If we face a problem or a conflict or a form of suffering and there is a solution for it, then there's no reason to be angry or upset because there's a solution. So we just need to apply the antidote, apply the solution. Yet, if we face suffering or a problem or a conflict and there is no solution, then why get upset? There's no reason. There's nothing we can do. And I would add to that one more factor. If we face a problem or a difficulty and we do not know the solution, then we should be happy because there may be one. So find it. So in synthesis, there's, there's no cause for anger. There's no reason to be angry. There's no reason to be upset. If we get upset or angry or frustrated, it's because we've become identified with a desire. <clears throat> we become identified with some kind of wish that's not being fulfilled. So in this way, we can understand that patience or endurance is really equivalent to serenity. The capacity to be serene. And there's another line in Shantideva's writings that's also good. He says, if I'm unable to bear even this minor suffering of the present, then why don't I ward off the anger that would be the cause of hellish pain? And we can extend that to all the egos. When we recognize that the ego is the producer of suffering, and all it will produce is suffering, then we need to eliminate that. The Master Samael said in the Peace of Sophia Unveiled that initiates must learn how to live serenely and gently within the terrors of the abyss and the night. We have to learn to be serene and gentle within the abyss of our own mind and within the night, the spiritual night, the darkness. This is something we have to learn by disciplining our mind, by training ourselves in patience. The process of doing so is the process of initiation. To learn serenity is to learn to discipline the mind. When our mind is agitated, we have no serenity. We have no peace. 
Therefore, we cannot solve our problems. An agitated mind cannot solve any problem. Ever. It can only make it worse. Therefore, if our mind is agitated, the first thing we have to do is calm the mind. Relax the mind. Become serene. This is easy to see when you understand the nature of the four ethers. These ethers that we have in our ethereal body are like mirrors, like the surface of water, like a lake. And they are used to transform and transmit energy. If the way that you look at a problem is through this surface, this mirror, but that mirror is undulating with waves and is very chaotic, the picture you see is distorted. So you cannot see the thing in the way it really is because the image is all messed up. This is what happens when your mind is agitated. The waters are moving too much. So let the water settle. Let the mind settle. When the mind is calm and serene, then you can see a perfect reflection of anything that you need to see. Now, this becomes especially important when you recall the name of this Bhumi. We're talking about the third paramita, patience or endurance, and the Bhumi is called luminous. That's in the Buddhist tradition. We're talking about the luminous ether as well, related to our ethereal body. The luminous ether is that aspect of the ethereal body that manages perception. Do you see the link? Do you see the connection? To develop patience or endurance is to develop serenity, which is develop a a calm and stable mind. And that is calm and stable bodhicitta, the ethereal body. The Master Samael says that the greatest obstacle to clairvoyance is anger. And that's because anger is a passion that stirs up all the waters, that agitates the mind. But anger is not just that overt outward expression of foul language or violence. It's also resentment. It's also depression. Anger has many forms, but in all its forms, whether outward or inward, whether overt or inverted, it distorts and disturbs the mind. This is why in Gnosis, when we teach about how to develop objective clairvoyance, the capacity to see beyond the physical senses, but objectively, clearly, without obscuration, the clearest antidote, the clearest solution, is to work on anger, to comprehend and eliminate anger, frustrated desire. So if you have a frustrated desire related to meditation, that is your obstacle. That is the thing that you need to work on. Because if you're frustrated with meditation, then you will not be able to meditate. Because the mind is frustrated. That's anger. That disturbs the water. Thus, there's no clarity, there's no serenity, and the mind is agitated. So comprehend that frustration. Learn how to transform that 
to learn from it. The place of this bumi, or level, and the place of this perfection, the paramita, is absolutely definitive in its structure in relation to the others. Without serenity, without patience, without endurance, you can't go further. It's impossible. It's the same as the other paramitas we've already discussed. If you don't have generosity, if you don't have that intention to develop the compassionate mind, you cannot enter the bodhisattva path. If you have the generosity, that generous spirit, loving kindness, started, you have the intention, then you need the discipline to manage the mind. But if you don't have that, you can't enter the path. But if you have the generosity and you have some discipline of the mind, then you need serenity. And if you don't have the serenity, you can't go further. So look at your own mind and work on these factors, these three forces. These three forces create generosity, discipline, patience. These three create the path. If you take one of these three out, there is no bodhisattva path for you. There is no way that you can work in this path. You must have these three qualities in development, balanced with each other, harmonized and synthesized. And this is because of very clear cause. We'll get to that in the subsequent lectures. To close, I will read to you a little bit from the book of Romans, from the New Testament. Uh, This book is a very clear document written for bodhisattvas. And the writer, it's Paul, right, explains that very well, very clearly in the first few lines of uh, Romans 8. But the part I want to read to you is the end of Romans 8. And this is some advice for us to help develop tolerance, the ability to endure suffering, to take what life gives us and accept that and take advantage of it. And he writes this, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also make intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is Christ. In synthetic terms, the bodhisattvas have Christ incarnated. And nothing can separate that from them except themselves. No matter how much suffering, no matter how much difficulty, no matter how much pain, the bodhisattvas have Christ inside. And if they learn to rely on that and cultivate their relationship with that bodhicitta, nothing can stop them. And that's what Paul is saying. This can inspire us. 
We are, may not be on that path yet, but we do have the essence. We do have the consciousness. And that consciousness is our connection to our own inner being. Who can help us? Who can guide us? Who can give us all of the elements that we need to grow? But remember something. He, as that parent, can't hold on to our bicycle if we really want to learn to ride it. Meaning that our being will let us suffer so that we will learn, so that we will grow. If we fail to take advantage of those experiences in order to improve ourselves, then we will remain weak, like babies who never learn to become self-reliant. The bodhisattva becomes perfectly self-reliant, but that self that they rely on is Christ. Any questions? Yes. Does patience become passive to certain repetitive events after you have transformed the initial event? I'll give you an example of everyday society, driving a car, right? Constant beeping, you know, I learned from beeping all the time, right? And you know, driving up with this anger to that person, and you see this little lady like being all grown that boss, right? So you transform that initial impression, right? So now it's like very passive to me in terms of, you know, before I beat that horn, I don't, you know, even think about, you know, doing it, you know. It's the patience that's there already, it seems. Now, is that a form of passiveness? That's well, <laughs> and you bring up a lot of things with that. Uh, the first thing I would say is there is no such thing as a repeated event. No event repeats exactly the same, ever. You can't say that one thing happens again and again because each time it happens, it's different. This is a very important thing because the nature of our mind is to go to sleep. And it goes to sleep because of habit. And we have the habit of thinking, oh, I've already been in this room, so I don't need to pay attention to it. Right? So then we have this sleepy, kind of half or not even at all aware state. We need to recognize that nothing is the same ever. Things are always changing from moment to moment. So even if you're driving to work on the same road every day, you have to really pay attention because that road is not the same. That trip is not the same. All those cars and all those people are not the same. There are differences. You are not the same. So I'd point that out to you first. The second, just because your reaction to a circumstance has changed does not necessarily mean that you have gotten better. It just means that your reaction has changed. Sometimes we experience a certain thing a few times, we become habituated to it. We become used to it. It doesn't mean that we stop suffering or that we're consciously transforming that. Some people, the first time they ride in a car, it's very uncomfortable for them. It's scary, right? It can be very uncomfortable. But then after a while, they get used to it, and then they don't pay attention anymore. It doesn't mean that they transformed the element in their mind that was reacting that way in the beginning. That element is still there. It's just not reacting the way it was before, or some other element is now reacting. So we have to be very careful with observing how we react to situations, particularly when situations come up that are similar to others. You may have somebody who has a very kind of sarcastic attitude, like always comes to you and says sarcastic things to you in kind of a joking way, and at first it hurts, Right, But after a while, you don't really notice it anymore. It doesn't mean that you're transforming. It just means that you've become accustomed to that pain. Right? So you have to observe carefully. If you're really working to transform something, what will, hurt, what will be new is your comprehension of it. When you understand that, then you can say that something is different. Like, for example, your example of the honking horns. 
your first reaction when you hear all the horns is you get agitated, right? Angry. But then when you saw the old lady who's lost, and you can't be angry at her. And that's a good thing for you to see because it helps you show the futility of your own anger. That becomes a, a jumping point for any other experience like that where you become frustrated. Then you can say, oh, I don't know what's happening here. Right? Why should I get angry? There might be a very good reason for this to be happening. A good case is a, a story I heard one time about a car accident. You know the story, right? The story basically is that there was a big car accident on the freeway and all the cars were blocked and backed up on the freeway and all the people in all the cars were angry. But one person was not. And they just figured maybe there was an accident or something bad and so they didn't get upset. Later, that person got a knock at their door and this person came to the door and said, I, just, I found you because I was in the car accident and I was out of my body. And I could see all the anger of all those people. But I saw one person who wasn't. And I remembered your driver's, your license plate number. And I came to thank you. Maybe that's just a folk tale. But it does demonstrate something. That our quality of mind has an impact on other people. But can trauma initiate that kind of patience? Yeah, of course. Suffering can impel us to behave properly if we take advantage of it. You know, a trauma or a bad situation can inspire us to act properly. If we see somebody hurt, physically hurt, we'll leap to help them, even if before that moment we thought they were an enemy. Right? You could be having a terrible argument with somebody, really angry, but if some accident happens and they get really hurt by something all of a sudden, we'll want to help them. So that shows the futility of the anger, the superficiality of the anger, and our root intention, which is actually good. So we should actually learn in advance of that, right? to not have to go through such traumatic situations in order to learn that. We can discipline ourselves without having to go through that kind of suffering. Any other questions? you were talking about sort of like facing your own filth. Um, but what about, humans seem to have this inclination to want to point out that to other people. It's sort of like self-righteousness. Um, so I don't know what my question is, except that it seems, to, it seems to get in the way a lot, and it seems to, even though my intention may be very good about saying, we well, you know you're doing this, and it's just not that healthy, and it's not that right, but it's not, it doesn't seem like it's actually a good attribute. Right. That is, a, that is a big problem. And actually, that becomes a really significant problem in students of Gnosis. We learn these teachings, and then many, some students start to get this idea that they need to go around telling everybody how Gnosis says they should be. This is actually not a good habit. The best way for you to deal with other people, when you see them performing something that you you believe is wrong or harmful is to restrain yourself and look at you from their point of view. Try to look at yourself through them to understand how they see you. To look through their eyes. And this is the measure of a good teacher. Someone who can really understand the mind of the other person and what they can and cannot receive. <coughs> Most of the time, when we go around telling people what they're doing wrong or what they should be doing, it will be received in the wrong way. Because most of us are too proud to take that kind of input from another person. So it depends on your relationship. You know, if you're a parent and child, then yeah, you need to tell them. As a parent, you need to tell your child right from wrong and give them your advice. But a child can't necessarily do that with a parent. And two equals can't necessarily do that. It depends on the relationship. So you have to be careful. The intention to help can actually harm. You know, when you try and give someone advice, you might actually turn them against you without meaning to. So this takes a lot of skill. Sometimes a good way to do it is to do it uh, in a roundabout way without 
manipulation and without pride. But maybe to give an example about yourself, without telling them why you're doing it, you know? But to do it in a way to, that's really for their benefit and not your own. And that's the other part. Sometimes when we want to tell other people how to behave or what they're doing wrong, it's because we're proud of ourselves and we feel superior to them. And if you feel that, don't say a word. It's better to transform your mind. And when you do say something, say it because you sincerely are concerned for them or care for them, but be careful how you say it, especially if somebody's really identified. And you know well that if you, go, if you approach an alcoholic to tell them they're an alcoholic and they need to quit, usually they'll get angry unless you get them in the right moment. And that takes skill to know that. And we're like that about all of our other defects, pride and anger and fear. So when we're acting in wrong ways, we're addicted to those things, just like an alcoholic. So it's very difficult to communicate that. Any other questions? You kept mentioning harm, harmful beings. Mm-hmm. Is that a contradiction? How can it be... Like, are we talking about the actual being? Or no, no. Just, about human being? just other people, other creatures. Oh. I'm talking about the moment. No, not talking about the moment. But, you know, a harmful person, a harmful entity of whatever kind. Because there's more than just human beings, right? There are other kinds of beings in the world. That's what I'm addressing. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Amen.